Okay, good morning, everybody, and um, uh, welcome to almost our last class, our second to last class. We are finishing off with our, dis our discussion of our plants today and on Monday, and that will be our final class. Um, so we've uh, learned a lot now about the evolution of plants, about how they moved up onto land, everything else. One of the really important things that we've learned about land plants is that they achieved an independence from standing water, which the primitive plants require for fertilization. But in addition, the land plants have de developed anatomical systems which allow them to absorb water from the ground, from groundwater, transport that water throughout the plant, use it in processes like photosynthesis and transport the products of photosynthesis all the way through the plant. And that is what we're going to be talking about today and um, on Monday. In, as a, um, a corollary of that, the development of, the, of these methods of transport also allowed plants to develop tremendous amount of strength in the body of the plant. And that allowed them to evade the uh, force of gravity. Um, I'm a little bit worried because there's nobody signed in and I'm kind of checking my phone to see whether I'm getting messages, but I'm not. So, all right, so we have a look here. Um, with the, um, when you think about uh, trees and things like that, the very largest of all land organisms are the are trees, these huge, huge um, organisms and a very complex organism. They've got billions of cells to them and uh, they need to be able to transport water. They need to be able to transport uh, the manufactured nutrients, etc. They need to move mineral nutrients through the plant. And yet when you look at a huge tree like a redwood or whatever, there is no beating heart there <clears throat> to drive <clears throat> the fluids the, of the plant around. There's no circulatory system, it seems, uh, that's equivalent to an animal's circulatory system with veins and arteries in. But in fact, there is. <clears throat> it's just not quite so obvious. And uh, we, um, <clears throat> uh, if we have a look at the structure of, of the plant, uh, we begin to see how the anatomy is organized in order to shunt all this material around. First of all, <clears throat> land plants have most, except for very specialized ones, um, have a, a root system. The root system penetrates through the ground and it does various things. It acts as an anchoring for the plant. <clears throat> it, acts, it may act as a storage organ as well. Many plants store nutrient. Um, in, in their root systems, like potatoes or whatever, <clears throat> but many, many plants use their roots as a storage organ. But their most important function in terms of the interaction with the rest of the plant is that the roots absorb water and they absorb other minerals as well. And they, the plant now has to get water and minerals, etc., from the root system all the way through to the rest of the plant. Above ground, the uh, plant consists of a shoot system and the shoots uh, and stems um, are arranged in a particular way. They have an internet a portion here, which is free of branches, free of leaves, etc., etc. that is called the internode and then at regular intervals, it, how they are arranged depends on the species of plant. There is a point where the stem bears a leaf, for example. And if we look at the, in the corner where the leaf joins the stem, there is usually a bud there. And um, the bud can develop into various things. The bud can develop into a, into a side branch. Um, the bud can also develop into a thorn. That's where thorns originate from. Um, it can also, in some instances, flower. The, the bud has, in other words, contains potential for ver forming various organs. 
um, the, the leaves are born at a region of the stem called the node. So there is an irregular nodes with internodes in between them. And um, the, uh, those buds can produce shoots and flowers are really modified shoots. In fact, the petals and everything of a flower are highly modified leaves that, that have evolved to attract pollinators. Okay, so that's the, your basic structure. Now we've got to think, how does the plant get water minerals from there up to there? The major organ of photosynthesis for plants is the leaf. So we've got leaves here, which are actively photosynthesizing, <clears throat> producing products which are dissolved in water. And those have now got to be funneled through to the rest of the plant. Again, there's no beating heart. So how on earth <clears throat> is it that the plants do that? Well, we're going to examine some of the structures, some of the vasculature of the plant that allows this kind of transport to take place. <clears throat> Before we do, um, we'll just mention a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, if we have a look uh, at the, just the basic structure of the plant, somehow or other we've got communication. We have a communication, let's go from the very furthest point of the root to the very tip here. We have a two-way communication that is, this is operating. And it's going to be operating through very small tubes that comprise the vasculature of the plant. So that, there are a couple of physical principles that operate here. The first is water column <clears throat> within a tube like that has a certain coherence. The water molecules actually are attracted to one another. And this gives a water a viscosity so that when, if I have a column of water and I lift the top of the column, the whole column will move. To, uh, there is a physical limit to, to how long that column of water can be. <clears throat> but nonetheless, for quite a distance, um, a, a column of water can be moved simply by lifting from the top. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that when we look at a plant, we, you'll see that there is, a po there is positive pressure and there is negative pressure operating to move fluid through the plant. And the positive pressure, for example, comes mainly from water pushing into the root cells. So the water is flooding into the cells of the root the whole time by osmosis. So we are pu putting water into the, and that water, uh, the volume of water in the roots is increasing and it is shunted into vessels which allow it to begin moving up. This, we also have positive pressures here in the leaves. Um, and the, 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 we have uh, actively pump, uh, we actively move water products of photosynthesis, for example, um, into vessels here. But the, the really important uh, kind of moving uh, forces in the plant. First of all, this from the roots, this root pressure. But second of all, um, water continually evaporates from the, from the leaves. So we are losing water volume from the plant here. And that provides a lifting force to, to fluids. So we have pushing here and we have lifting and we have a small amount of pushing here as well. So, um, the, this absorption of water and of minerals, um, it, it occurs in the roots, but not usually throughout the whole root. It's usually right near the ends of the roots. Um, higher up, the, the root becomes covered with a corky kind of covering and no longer does much absorption of water. But most of the water and minerals <clears throat> are absorbed in areas close to the ends of the roots. And there we will find that the surface area of the root cells is enormously increased 
because they produce these very fine root hairs. Each of these, one of these root hairs emerges from a single cell and it's a long extension into the soil and um, a very thin wall. So water passes into them, water and minerals pass into them very, very easily. So that's the first thing. There is another thing though about land plants, which um, is a key feature of their evolution in uh, since 200 million years ago, or even more. And that is that there is a very close association of plant roots with fungi. These are the fungi that are associated with these plant roots are called mycorrhizal fungi. Um, there are many kinds of them, and there are many very, very complex kinds of interactions with the mycorrhizae. Um, I, I'll point out many of our edible mushrooms that you collect under forest trees and everything, they're actually the fruiting bodies of mycorrhizal fungi, which are wrapped around the roots of the trees they grow under. This mycorrhizal um, association is a very ancient and a very intimate one. So the fungi are intimately associated, they, they are tied to their, kind, their hosts. And the hosts depend very strongly on the mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae do various things. They increase the ability of plants to absorb water and minerals. And that is their main function. But they appear to have other functions as well. They seem to interact in plant cycles and things as well. A very ancient, very, very intimate association. So um, it's a symbiosis. And it's in fact a mutualism because both parties, the fungus and the, tr the plant, both benefit from the, from the association. Okay, so then um, the, the um, I should just say something about the roots, but the other thing about the roots. Um, the, the first thing is that we do see some differences in the structuring of roots. Um, this root here is a typical eudicotyledonous plant for a eudicotyledonous plant. And the, most of the, not all, but most of the eudicotyledonous plants produce a main root that penetrates through the soil. And that is the tap root. And then the tap, you can think of the tap root like being an underground stem almost because uh, uh, side roots branch out from it, although they don't branch from buds the way they do on the stem. So uh, uh, eudicotyledons has a tap root with side branches, but the monocots do not do this. Instead, uh, monocots, they put down an initial uh, uh, root when the embryo is growing, but that soon uh, disappears. And instead we get from this area here, close to the stem, we get the formation of a net uh, of roots that reach out and uh, which um, form this kind of fibrous mass under the ground. I should mention that in e ecological terms, roots are tremendously important. First of all, they penetrate the soil and break the soil up, they aerate the soil. <clears throat> and second of all, um, they hold soil. They allow uh, the soil to resist the forces of erosion. So in the ecological terms, roots are, are hugely important. Uh, just one second, please. Um, all right, so that's the, those are the two kinds of root structures the, for eudicots and monocots. And um, the next, the other uh, major uh, plant organ that we need to talk about, the structure, are the leaves themselves. And the leaf is the main photosynthetic organ. It's not the only photosynthetic organ. You will observe that uh, very often uh, plants have green stems, which are also photosynthetic. But the leaves are organs which are specially modified to maximize the photosynthetic capability. That's why they're flat. They're flat so that they, <clears throat> first of all, um, they receive plenty of oxygen, I mean, uh, plenty of carbon dioxide and water. 
and they are able to void the oxygen that they produce. Uh, second of all, the flat leaf means that you have a big surface area to receive lots of light. And so the leaves, they're, they're intercepting light, they're exchanging gases. They're also, believe it or not, an important way in which the plant the, uh, voids heat. This is something we never think about. But plants also produce metabolic waste heat, which needs to be voided. And this is largely voided through the leaves. And that is also by the process of transpiration, by evaporation of water from the leaf surface. So the <clears throat> leaves have a very simple an external anatomy. They have a complex internal anatomy. We'll only discuss it later. Um, here is the, the, this flattened part is called the blade of the leaf. And uh, we, uh, the, in, it depends on the kind, whether you're talking about eudicots or monocots, um, but this is a eudicot leaf in this leaf, and it has a main vein running through here, the midrib, and branched veins off the midrib there. Um, this stalk here is, has a special name, it's called the petiole, and the petiole is what attaches the leaf to the stem. Uh, so uh, what the main things you need to remember, the blade, and then uh, the petiole, and then the veins. Now this venation is, varies um, in the eudicotyledonous plants and monocotyledonous plants. In monocotyledonous plants, the venation is actually parallel. So here are the veins here. And um, that in most uh, eudicotyledonous, in most <coughs> monocotyledonous plants, this constrains the leaf shape. It's usually a blade shape or a long shape uh, with parallel venation like this. In most of the eudicotyledonous plants, the venation is stellate like this, or it, um, it may be bilaterally symmetrical as we saw in the previous, uh, previous plant. But um, we in eudic most eudicotyledonous plants, um, there are these branching veins in the leaf. I say most because there are a couple of specialized um, eudicotids which actually have, also have parallel venation. It's, but when you look at the embryo, and when you look at very young plants, you see that in fact they have they start off with branching. It's specialization they, that they develop uh, parallel venation in eudicots if they do it at all. So you'll be aware of the fact um, when many many different kinds of leaves and observing leaf form is an important way of trying to identify plants. So uh, this is typical oak leaf. This is a simple leaf. That is what it's called, a simple leaf, simply a blade and the petiole. Now, in the, the one important feature to note about leaves is in the axis there, in this little angle there where the petiole fits, there's always a bud. And um, that, bud, that is the bud, that's an auxiliary bud, which has this potential to form different organs for the plant. A compound leaf is one with leaflets and uh, joins usually to a main leaf here, although they sometimes may uh, just form a, a hand-shaped sort of leaf like that. So uh, this is still a leaflet. And this here is the petiole. This, these here have their own name, they're called stipules. But um, don't, don't worry about that. Um, the, the compound leaves may be very compound. They may subdivide and subdivide, be very finely divided into many different leaflets. Um, but uh, the, uh, yes, the leaflets here, there's no auxiliary bud there. Okay, so this is not a this is not a branch. This this is the still the petiole with the branches with the leaf blades coming off it. Okay, so now we've got to think. Um, about how it is that plants manage to move fluids back and forth and back and forth through. We have very simply talked about the kinds of physical forces that may be operating. But now we need to talk about the anatomical structures that allow movement to take place. And in order to do so, we've got to understand something about plant tissues. <clears throat> 
because the interior of the plant is actually quite complex. It has a complex anatomy. There are three basic uh, tissue types that we're going to talk about. The first are the outer tissues. And um, uh, in common parlance, we'd be thinking about, we'd be call it the bark. It's not necessarily bark, but we'll see what constitutes true bark and what doesn't. But there's an outside covering. In very young plants and um, in plants uh, which don't become, very often in annuals that only last a year or that don't develop wood, then um, the outer covering is a simple epidermis. It's a single layer of tissue. But in other plants, um, a thicker layer of dermal tissue develops, which is what we would refer to as the true bark. That's the one tissue type. The next tissue type is um, the, tissue the tissue which actually transports, it transports fluid. There's dedicated tissue which transports fluid vertically through the plant up and down. And um, this is called the vascular tissue. And the vascular tissue has two important functions. The first is of course transport. But the second uh, function of the vascular tissue is to provide structure. And we'll see exactly how that happens in a, in a minute. The third type of tissue is the surrounding tissue. Um, it's, I would, I'd say, almost like the supporting tissue. Um, and uh, this is tissue which is neither dermal nor vascular. And that we call the ground tissue. And um, it may be sometimes be specialized, but um, uh, usually thin, relatively thin walled cells. And in the interior, if it's inside the, the stem, we call it pith. But if it's out, on the outside, we call it the cortex. And we'll see the, the boundary is actually this uh, circle of vascular tissue. If it's inside the vascular tissue, it's called the pith. If it's outside the vascular tissue, it's called the cortex. And uh, the way in which these tissues are organized, it does vary depending on what part of the plant uh, we are, we're actually talking about. So if we come down here to the roots, um, the, here, this is how it's done. Here, um, especially in the young roots, uh, not in aged roots, but in the young roots, there is a, a layer of dermal tissue there around the outside. In the youngest roots, that would simply be epidermis. And uh, very often that epidermis will be the cells that have root hairs to them. Um, here uh, in the center here is uh, ground tissue. And in the roots, the vasculature is constrained to the very center. It form there. It forms a cylinder in the center of the root. A there's a we'll see later, there's a little bit of difference in the organization between dicots and eudicots of this central part, but this is the basic structure in the root. As we ascend through the stem, we find that uh, is especially, uh, this is young stem or else stem which doesn't produce wood. We see here's the dermal tissues here, ground tissue, so this is cortex here, and this is pith in here. And these here are vascular bundles. This is the vascular tissue organized into these strands, these bundles. When we cut across it, they look, they form these bundles. Up in the leaves, this is flattened out. There is a lot of ground tissue. And uh, the ground tissue is highly, highly modified in leaves. It becomes the photosynthetic tissue. And um, the photosynthetic tissue uh, through, throughout the leaves is actually called the mesophyll, but it's gra basically ground tissue. Here's the, the dermis here in the leaves is very important uh, because it actually uh, functions in, uh, in transpiration, in regulating the loss of water through, from, by the leaf and also allowing carbon dioxide and water vapor uh, into the, the interior of the, the cell, of the leaf rather. And uh, these here are vascular, this is the vasculature now feeding out through the whole leaf 
to effect transport up and down through the leaf. Okay, so this, uh, some of the specializations of, the, of the, these different tissues. First of all, the dermal tissue on the outside. It is a protective, it forms a protective outer coat. And in young uh, stems and also in plants which uh, don't form wood, very often that epidermis persists and the epidermis may also be photosynthetic. You may see that it is green. Um, but uh, it's usually also covered with a, a coating called, uh, it's actually usually a waxy coating um, called the cuticle. Um, the cut there may also be cuticle formed of, of um, uh, I, my brain has gone dead. Anyway, I'll think of it in a minute. Never, never mind for a moment. Um, cellulose is the word I was thinking of. It may, there may be a cuticle also formed of, of cellulose. And uh, these are acting to limit, to try and limit transpiration. Transpiration, the loss of water by the plant is very strictly controlled by the plant. And uh, <clears throat> the, in aging plants and in woody plants, this epidermis of the periderm is actually lost. And instead it is replaced by another set of layers of, of tissue, which are much thicker and very often contain cork. And um, that one, once that happens, once the, that uh, epidermis is lost, it, we usually refer to that then as being the periderm. And the periderm may actually be really thick as we'll, we'll see in, in a while. So the vascular tissue, um, which is, affects the most of the transport through the plant. Uh, there are two major divisions of kind of vessel, of tube, if you want it that way, of vascular tissue. And uh, these are the xylem and the phloem. And xylem conducts water up from the roots, up through and through the entire plant. Yeah, with that goes of all the minerals which the plant needs as well. Phloem transports products of photosynthesis, such as sugars, uh, from where they are made to throughout the plant. Remember that the, the, the roots also have to be supplied with nutrient. They have to be supplied with nutrient provided by, by the, the photosynthesis. So the vascular tissue now, we've talked about the dermal, now the vascular tissue, um, collectively when we look at its organization, we refer to it as the steel. And the organization of the steel, it varies. It varies from species to species, but it also varies from position in the plant, whether you're talking about roots, stems, leaves, as we've seen before. But it also varies with age. So you may see one arrangement of the steel in young parts of the plant, and you may see an entirely different organization of the steel in older parts of the plant. And um, in the angiosperms, uh, the organization leads to production of a cylinder of vascular tissue. And that cylinder is incredibly strong. So most of the very large plants that we see, the trees, these, they're actually eudicotyledons because they have this very strong central part. In monocotyledons, it's very difficult for them to do that because the, vas the, the steel is scattered throughout the stem. The vascular bundles are randomly scattered through the stem and they can't make this big, thick central column that would provide them with strength. Um, so the, when we look at the, at, at the vascular bundles, we're going to see in a while that in fact they, the phloem and the xylem are organized separately from one another, but they together form a vascular bundle. So the vascular bundle may change structure as we age the plant. Tissue which is neither dermal nor vascular, that is ground tissue. And um, the ground tissue often is highly specialized. In the leaves, it is specialized for photosynthesis. 
elsewhere in the plant, it may be specialized for support, it may be thickened to provide support. And it can also provide short distance transport. And this is really important because we've got to move stuff sideways as well as up and down. And that is often the responsibility of the ground tissues is to pass nutrients sideways to cells throughout the, the, the stem of the plant. Okay, so let's have a look at the organization. The easiest to understand um, uh, is the organization of the eudicotyledonous plant. And I emphasize that um, this is a young plant. This is a young plant. We're going to see how this actually changes in the aging plant. So here is the dermal tissue around the outside. It's a young plant. It's still got an epidermis just the single layer. Here's cortex tissue, ground tissue. Here is the pith here. Um, and uh, this word here, parenchyma, so refers to the cell structure. The parenchyma cells are usually polygonal cells with thin walls. That's, that's all. Um, so uh, there are lots of terms here that you don't need, need to worry about. But look, you'll see here, these are the vascular bundles organized here. Uh, in the circle around. So this is the steel there. This is an important word, cambium. And cambium is tissue, which is essentially stem cells. They are undifferentiated dividing cells, which when they divide, they reproduce themselves, but they produce cells which proceed to differentiate. So this, you picture it this way, the cambium here is producing xylem cells. The xylem cells are here in the center, towards the center. The phloem cells are here towards the outside. And um, there's very often a very, uh, on the, there's a kind of a cap there, um, which is strengthening tissue, very thick walled cells called sclerenchyma. <laughs> um, but the tissues that we are really interested in are the phloem here, and the xylem, and those are produced here by the cambium. Here's a real section, and um, uh, you can see the vascular bundles quite clearly. And you'll see immediately, you're looking at it, that there's some difference in the structure of the xylem there and of the phloem cells here. In between is the cambium there. This is a young stem. The vascular bundles are quite separate from one another. But what we're going to find is that eventually as the stem ages, this cambium extends sideways until it forms almost a circle like this. And it begins to produce not these bundles of phloem and xylem, but cylinders of phloem and xylem. Very, very strong and very important for structuring the plant. But this is a young stem. The vascular bundles are still quite separate. So here's a, a structure of a, a vascular bundle. Um, there is uh, usually a defining layer of ground tissue around the vascular bundle. Um, and then uh, there's also a layer here, which you can see, which is called the bundle sheath. And um, if you look in, the, this would be the end center of, this, of the stem here. This is the outside of the stem here. And uh, he, this tissue, all of this tissue here is phloem tissue. So this is tissue which is conducting material from the, the top down. So it's, this is the tissue which conducts the products of photosynthesis. This tissue here, including these giant vessels here, this is xylem tissue there. And there's one difference to note immediately about the difference between the phloem and the xylem. Xylem very often is thick walled. That is because the cells of the of xylem lay down very thick layers of a, a substance called lignin in the walls, extremely strong substance. And it's lignin that actually makes up what we understand to be wood 
when you look at wood, what you're actually looking at are heavily, heavily lignified xylem cells. The phloem cells are not thickened to any great extent. So they are thin walled. The xylem is usually thick walled. And um, the, the other thing I'll just tell you right now is that uh, many of the xylem cells are in fact no longer living. Um, once they're heavily lignified like that, um, they lose the, the, their cytoplasm and everything else. They are basically just tubes, long tubes. But the xylem, the phloem cells are um, living cells, although there's something that we need to understand about the way in which they live. Okay, so to have a look first at, at those xylem cells, and uh, you will see um, just from this diagram that they're different kinds. These big round ones are called vessels. And these smaller ones here uh, are called tracheids. So the, first of all, the tracheids are heavily, heavily lignified and they actually all, you can see the way in which um, they actually all join together. The, the tracheids are these small tubes here, not these big ones. These big ones here are vessels. These are tra these tracheids in between. And you see how they begin to form a solid mass perforated by the tubes. Uh, these are tracheids here. They are long uh, cells and they communicate with one another. There are pits where they abut on one another. There are pits between wide pits to allow free movement of water. And uh, that so the water can move sideways as well as vertically. Uh, these here are uh, vessels, and these are usually shorter cells, but they're very, very wide. And um, <coughs> that the, the ends there are of each cell, there is a plate perforated by big holes to allow free movement of water through, through the vessel. Um, most of these are non-living. It's only at the very edges where they're newly produced that we, 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 we find living xylem cells. Okay, so the phloem cells are different. Phloem cells now are alive um, at maturity, but very strangely, the major conducting vessels of the phloem um, are very strangely structured. They uh, are relatively wide and they uh, contain a thin layer of cytoplasm, but they have no other organelles. They have no nucleus, nothing like that, but they're still alive and they exist in, in concert with a neighboring cell, which is kind of a supporting cell, which performs all the metabolic activities that is shared with the, the phloem tube itself. And um, they, this is called a companion cell. And um, uh, very hard to see it here, but there's a little tiny cell there next to one of these. And that is a companion cell. Oh, I think we'll see one in a diagram in a minute. The chains of phloem cells are connected with one another. And at each end, they have a, it's called a sieve plate. And it's, again, it's a plate perforated to allow the free movement of fluids through the tube system. So it, it ends up forming a tube system which runs through the whole length of the plant. So uh, here are some pictures of the phloem cells. Um, this is a phloem cell here, and this is called a tube element. It's not a vessel, it's a tube element. So, so it's a phloem tube element, and it's a sieve tube because it has at the end of the cell, it has the sieve plate there. And next to it here, as shown in the diagram here, and in cross section here, this is the cell here. That is the companion cell. And the companion cell is the living functioning part, a companion to, to the tube element. 
and it it basically performs the functions which maintain the living nature of the cytoplasm of the, of the tube element. The phloem cells are thin-walled. This becomes important later on. It's important to remember that. They are thin-walled and easily crushed um, by growth, this especially during growth. So um, and you can see here as well, they do communicate very widely with one another. Uh, the, these wide elements, they are connect sideways as well with one another through pits in the wall. Okay, so let's have a, let's, now we've got some understanding uh, just about the different tissues and the structures and everything else. Um, we need to talk a little bit about plant growth and how uh, exactly how a plant grows. Plants have a very special way of growing and that is their growth is indeterminate. It is continual. Plants continually grow as long as they're alive. They're continually growing. Growth may slow. It may slow down, but it does not stop and growth always takes place due to the activity of these specialized tissues called the meristems. And the meristems, you can think of them as being, as I've told you before, you can think of them as being plant stem cells. This is in complete contrast to animals. Animals have determinate growth. They reach a certain size and growth stops. They don't just continue growing and growing and growing and growing. Even relatively simple animals like sponges, for example, seem to have a determinate size to which they will grow and then not grow anymore. Plants continue growing throughout their lives and they do it in this particular way. Um, they, they grow from the top. Remember that silly little riddle I told, asked you before? You carve something on a tree trunk, you come back years later, is it higher? No, it's not higher. It's the same height as you've carved it because plants do not grow throughout the stem length. They grow from the very tip. And they can do this, obviously, if this plant had branches, it'd be growing from the tips of the branches. And the root system does exactly the same. The root grows from the tip as well, down. There is a very small amount of growth behind the tips, because what happens is that the plant will produce cells which can then elongate. So there is some lengthening of the plant, but it, takes, it actually also takes place quite quickly behind the, the, the growing tip. So at the tips of both, sh both shoots and of the roots, there is an area of very undifferentiated uh, cell. Um, and these are actively growing. And this is because it's this kind of stem cell tissue. It's referred to as a meristem. And this is the apical meristem. So the apical meristem is continually producing cells and the apical meristem is continually moving forward. Okay, because it's producing cells behind here, it moves forward like this. There, the, there is another set of meristem as one of the functions of some of these cells. Then as they move behind, they begin to specialize. And one of the things they may specialize into is a little bit of ape of side meristem here, which can form, then grow later on to form a leaf. So this is also meristematic tissue here, but it's going to grow to pr produce the leaf. Um, the stem, the cells which are produced by the apical meristem here, they proceed backwards and begin to become more determinant. Their fate begins to be determined. Initially, they are entirely meristematic. They um, have no real determinate fate, but uh, these ones out here are going to form uh, dermal tissues. These in here are going to form what I told you before, is the cambium. And um, the, it begins now as they, as they age, they begin to assume their final fate. These cells may divide actively um, 
especially sideways, to increase diameter of the growing shoot. But once they mature here, here's ground tissue, dermal tissue, and vascular tissue. Once they mature, they cease to be able to divide, excepting where they preserve their meristematic quality. There is a layer of meristem here, which forms the vascular cambium that we talked about before. There may also be meristem out here that is going to may form the dermal tissues. Okay, so let's have a look um, just at a, a little bit of how <clears throat> the stem changes, how the structure changes as we, especially as we age the stem, especially as we move backwards. Okay, we go, we got all our growth taking place at the very tip of the apex, the apical meristem, very undifferentiated as it goes right behind it, still not differentiated, but beginning to differentiate and still meristematic, then further behind, it becomes differentiated. And this is what we end up with. We saw earlier in young stem, we have the ground tissues, the dermal tissues around the outside, and we have cambium, that is meristematic tissue in here, producing phloem and producing xylem. As the stem ages, the tissue, the meristematic tissue here becomes active in between, in between these bundles. And we begin, instead of producing these discrete bundles like this, instead, that begins to produce uh, cylinders of vascular tissue. So when we look uh, at, we look at a, a kind of intermediate stem, what we'll see, we can see here's the remains of this there, call it the primary phloem. Here's the remains of the early xylem, the primary xylem there. But this here, the cylinder of phloem and the cylinder of xylem, we call secondary tissue. And this is produced by this meristem, which we call the secondary cambium, um, and that this, or secondary or vascular cambium, this is the other name. And this now is going to be responsible for producing these cylinders. And it is probably familiar to you that, or you probably intuit that this is why when we look at a piece of wood cut across, we see these circles because the, this, this vascular cambium has activity which is very high in summer and much less in winter. So it tends each year to produce a ring of phloem and a ring of xylem. Phloem on the outside, xylem on the inside. Remember what I told you, this side, this phloem is very thin walled and is easily crushed. So last year's phloem tends to be crushed by the growth, by the new growth and disappear into just a layer. The xylem on the other hand is thick, it's thick walled and it's, and it's, the, 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 it's non-living and it's heavily invested with lignin. It's not gonna be crushed, it's gonna be preserved and it gets, starts to be preserved as a cylinder right through the center of the plant. And that is what we recognize as being wood. So wood is largely secondary growth. It's just, all of this is secondary growth and it is secondary growth, which is responsible for expanding the diameter of a stem. Apical growth expands the length of the stem. Secondary growth expands the diameter of the stem. And this is how it does it. It's like a conveyor belt. Okay. So <clears throat> I'll finish with this and I'll return to it when we get back to it on Monday. I'll just quickly show you. We end up in the plant with two kinds of, of meristem in an aging stem. We end up with a cambium on the outside, which is going to replace the dermal tissues, and this is called the, the va this is called the cork 
cambium. And it produces a specialized type of cell, which is also largely non-living, excepting when it's very newly produced. And um, it has the, the properties, which are familiar to you about cork. Empty, the, the cells are empty. They're quite thick-walled, but they are um, relatively flexible. But very importantly, they are impervious to water. And it's a major way of protecting the stem. They're tough, protects the stem, but it protects it especially from water loss. And it can be quite thick. So here's a, the, the cork cambium here. And um, the cork cambium produces cells in one direction only, okay, towards the outside. Here on the inside, we have our, now our va the vascular cambium. And the vascular cambium is producing secondary xylem, secondary phloem. So it's here, the red blocks here as the cambium. And you can see that it produces phloem cells towards the outside, xylem cells towards the inside. And every year, this is moving further and further and further out. This vascular cambium is moving further and further out as the diameter of that central core of xylem tissue begins to expand. This is the major way in which the plant increases its diameter. But notice that at the same time, what it's doing is it's providing itself with this incredibly strong skeleton through the center of the plant. In young plants, they don't have this kind of, uh, much of this kind, they have some, but they don't have much of this kind of strengthening. And a lot of the strength to a young plant or to many annual plants and things like this is provided purely by the hydraulic pressure inside the vessels of the xylem. That's the main source of support for a, a soft plant. And this is familiar to you. If you starve a plant of water, the plant will wilt. And it will wilt because it loses the strength provided by the hydraulic pressure inside its vessels. Pour water on it again, and very soon the root pump water up through the whole plant and it will stand back up upright again. Okay, so we'll stop there and I'll return to this on Monday and that will be uh, our last class, all right?